thank you to all of you who have made 11.30 your, your gathering. We shifted our times last weekend, and so we're two weeks into it. And, and here's what I want to say. Uh, we did it, like, like we said earlier, to make room for guests. We had, I think last weekend, 128 first-time guests just last weekend. So we're, we're doing it to make room for guests. And here's what I, w- I want you to hear. It worked. It's working. Thank you. We had last week the biggest attendance we've ever had in our history, and we still had room in every single gathering for more people. So thank you. More people rode the shuttle than ever before. More kids up in Hillside Kids than ever before. Um, we had, that's just good. Thank you for being, for being willing to, to be a part of that. Um, Last week, over 250 of you, I think, started Rooted. 200 plus others of you started a journey through 1 Samuel. So, like, we really believe. We don't just sing it. We believe Jesus changes everything. And this past week, in the last seven days, in our high school ministry, in our uh, junior high ministry, here's what I want you to know. It's amazing. We've had 56 students this week stand and declare, I believe in Jesus has changed their lives. So we're thrilled with that. We're thrilled at what God is doing. And then you're probably wondering, why do you have an anchor in your hand? Thank you for asking. I wanted to tell you about this anchor. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, my, my dad bought our family a boat. Not just any boat, but a 17-foot Boston Whaler Montauk. We loved this boat. Here's a picture of a, of a similar boat. Like, we loved this boat, and I loved to be the guy on the front fishing with my dad driving me wherever I needed to go to fish. Um, this boat was amazing. The boat did amazing things. Like, look at this picture. We were flying through the, I wish that was us. Like that would be my dream for that to be my dad driving me and flying through the air. Uh, But this boat was amazing. Like their marketing of this Boston Whaler uh, 17 foot Montauk, they had a chainsaw and they cut it into three pieces because Boston Whalers were filled with foam and, and they wanted to prove all three pieces individually would float. It was an amazing boat. So we had this boat and we would go out um, to the intercoastal waterway to a place called Hammocks Beach on the south outer banks of North Carolina. And in order to get there, you had to navigate through sandbars and little islands uh, that were out in the channel. And, and you would get to the, the edge of Hammocks Beach. On the front side of the Hammocks Beach is the ocean. The waves are crashing. But on the back side, is, it's almost more like a lake. It's the intercoastal waterway. And you could actually take your boat and pull right up to the edge of the beach. And I had one job, one job, to stand on the front of the boat with the anchor in my hand. And when the boat approached shore and got to a place where I could get in, jump off the boat onto the shore, run up to the shore, and plant the anchor as deeply as I could in the sand— because there's a current and it would drag the boat away. So my job was to plant the anchor deep enough into the sand that when we went and played for two or three hours, we came back and there was still a boat there, like it hadn't washed down. I have one hope and one focus today. It's to help anchor our souls into who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. That's my focus today. Because I know that some of us are in a a place in life that feels pretty stormy, pretty hard, or or, or confusing. Or maybe we're just looking for hope in a world that feels like it's just full of despair. My focus, like I'm on the front of the boat with an anchor in the hand, is help remind us of the anchor the foundation we have in Jesus. And Jesus changes everything. Do you believe that? Jesus changes everything. Last week, we, we began talking in this concept of hope from Romans chapter 15. And we took verse 13 and we offered it up as a prayer. I want you to do that with me right now. We're going to put it on the screens and, and we're going to read this, but not just read a Bible verse. We're going to Read it as a prayer. God, may this be true of us. Here's verse 13. Let's let's say this aloud together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We were reminded that 
Our God, the, the biblical God, the one true God is a God of hope. He stands against a, a world that may be hopeless, a, a world that's got plenty of despair. He stands against it as a God of hope, not against it in the sense of he's against it, but he's for the world. He wants the world to have hope, yet in the world there's not a lot of hope. And, and Paul is praying that this God, who is a God of hope, would fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him. As we trust in him, listen, so that our lives would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is something that we don't talk a lot about. Maybe we don't even think a lot about it because often there's not a lot in this world to give us hope. But the Bible keeps inviting us again and again as we read it to be people who are full of hope. There, in my opinion, there should be no more hopeful people in all of the world than the people of Jesus. Amen? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, little man. May the God of hope fill us with his hope. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. And really, all I want you to do is see part of one verse. That we're just going to stay there for our time together. I want, I want to implore you to think about this verse, and may it be true of us. The writer of Hebrews is writing and frequently talks about this concept of hope, talks about this concept of, of a strong and a sure foundation for our lives. That when storms come and when problems and suffering and stress comes our way that we can be rooted and grounded in hope. And then in chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Would, would you read that out loud with me? Just one voice. Let's read this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So this verse has a lot in it. And quickly, let me just set a context that what the writer of Hebrews is, is talking about is not just the superficial things of our life. It's not just the, the passing temporal things of our life. The, the writer of Hebrews is not talking about that we would have the right kind of feelings, although feelings and emotions are, are good and right. We've got to pay attention to them. Not that we just have the right kind of thinking, and perspective, although that's, that's good, but, but deeper things, not just that circumstantially we have like success or, or we have it together, not just that on the superficial exterior things of life that, that everything's going good. The writer of Hebrews is saying there's something deeper. There's a hope that is an anchor for our soul. Can I just ask you this and, and have you honestly Think about this. How is your soul? How's your soul? Like a lot of times people ask, hey, how you doing? Or, hey, how are you feeling? But how's your soul? Like on a, on a deep, deep level. On a you and God kind of level. How's your soul? Because circumstances in our life will come, and sometimes they'll be up, sometimes they'll be down. They, they can move us all around. But if our souls are anchored, we can endure all kinds of things. How's your soul? See, Jesus talks about this idea when a teacher of the law comes and says, what's the greatest commandment in all of the world? And, and Jesus responds, well, the, the greatest commandment is this. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, with all of your heart, your feelings, your emotions, with all of your mind, that your thinking, your wisdom, your thoughts are in the right place, your strength, your abilities, your resources. But he also says your soul, the deep, deep part of of your humanity that's in touch with God, how's your soul doing? And here's what the writer of Hebrews says, that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, and there's just two simple words, firm and secure. Firm and secure. Firm is the idea of sure, certain, true. How's your soul? That, that an, an anchor for our soul is this. I don't, I don't know if you have thought about this recently, but the purpose of an anchor, if I can undo this, 
By the way, uh, when, I, when I wasn't just in charge of the anchor pulling to the, to the beach, I was in charge of dropping the anchor when we were in deep water. And most of the time I did a really, really good job, except for that one time when I dropped it and I watched the end of the rope go, we got to get a new anchor, Dad. Sorry. It was gone. Because, you know, the, the concept of an anchor is it's got to be anchored on that end, right? Like it's got to have a, a firm foundation, but it's also got to be anchored on this end <laughs> or the anchor does no good. And, and I'm not talking about like holding on loosely. I'm talking about like when I tie, I don't know how to tie a good knot. Like I was not a Boy Scout. I'm not a sailor. So when I tie, I'm like wrapping the rope around everything because I lost an anchor once and I don't want to do that again. I'm talking about this idea. God will not let go of you. So don't let go of him. This hope as an anchor for the soul is firm. Why is it firm? Because it's in a good foundation. It's, it's in a, a solid foundation. We're being held. It's firm because it's not in your circumstance. It's not in what we possess in this world. It's, it's in God himself. The rock solid faithfulness of who God is, is, is where our hope is firm. Here, here's what I want you to know. We can place our hope in all kinds of other places. Can, can I just tell you a few places we, we do it that are good places, but they, they don't really work? I've heard people say things like this. If anything ever happened to my children, I couldn't go on in my life. Really. So what happens if your child gets really, really sick? What happens if your child rebels and runs away? What happens? I don't know. What happens if it's just in a good thing, but not an ultimate thing? I, I've heard people say things like, oh, my spouse, my marriage, if anything happened to it, my world would come crashing down. Really? That, that's the immovable anchor of your life? Listen, marriage is a good thing. Children, family is a good thing, but it can't be the ultimate thing. I've heard people say, I've got my dream spouse, or I've got my dream job, or I've got my dream house. It can't get any better than this. Really? What happens if you lose that house or you lose that spouse? I'm, I'm going to keep rhyming. What happens if you're not anchored in the immovable, the firm, the secure, is that if any of those circumstantial things is impacted, your life is shipwrecked. But here's what the writer of Hebrews says. We have this anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And, and you know this, but, but let's just think about it. If you're anchored, it doesn't mean you're immovable, does it? It means you will move. It means you can, can, can have some movement. You can have ups and you can have downs. There's some kind of movement, but there's an anchor somewhere else that is immovable. And so what we're being told is we can have a hope that comes from God that is immovable even when we're moving in life. Even when the hard times come, even when the suffering comes, even when the doubt or the fear or the stress or the worry, when it comes and it moves us around, that hope is still an anchor for the soul. We know we're being held on and we can hold on as well. Firm. Firm. No matter what. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of, of how this hope is firm. Um, Anybody in here a, a Chicago Cubs fan? Anybody? And you're, you're, you're willing to admit it. There's one. How many else? Raise your hand high if you are. Two, three. Okay. Now, now hold on. Make sure before you raise your hand, you've been a Chicago Cubs fan more than 12 months, right? It wasn't just last year when they started doing good, right? Okay. So just think, let me talk to you, three of you, four of you. A Chicago Cubs fan that for 108 years, you non-baseball people, did not win a World Series, right? And did you ever have a time, Chicago Cubs fans, in those 108 years, even if your span was 10 years, that you thought, maybe this is a worthless cause rooting for the Chicago Cubs? 
And then last year, you're like, look, it wasn't a hopeless cause. So Chicago Cubs fan, would you just stand for me real quick? Just stand up real quick. Be bold. Hey, don't be embarrassed if you're a Cubs fan. Be, be proud of it. There's two. That's it. Okay, everybody look back there. Everybody look back there. Well, there's, there's three, but I don't know if, I don't know what her say-so is in it. There's three people. If you've ever felt hopeless in a rooting for a sports team that you can now say, but there's still hope. If the Chicago Cubs can win it after that long, there's hope for my team too. Anybody in here been married more than 20 years? Anybody been married more than 30 years? Oh. Awesome. Anybody been married more than 40 years in here? Love it. That's so incredible. Okay. So, yeah. So, now's the moment of real honesty. Has anybody in here been married for more than 20 years and at some point in those 20 years thought, this is really hard. I'm not sure we're going to make it. But you're here today and you're like, but there was hope. We did make it. Anybody, you, you fit that category. Do this. Will you stand up for me right now and just look around this room? So, so stay standing. What I love is when one spouse is pulling the other spouse up. Stand. Because there was a time I, did, I was about to give up on you. Here's what I want you to do. Look around. If you've not been married 20 years, if you've not endured hard times, if you think, I don't know there's any hope for my marriage, here are people saying, but I have stood and I can tell you there is still hope even through the hard times, right? Okay, thank you. You can sit down. Okay. Anybody in here who you've ever personally or someone that you love has faced a diagnosis and you thought, I don't know if we can keep going on. I don't know if there's any hope. And then you went through a season of difficult, difficult time. Maybe you, the loved one passed away or maybe they're still fighting or maybe they, they're, they're healed, they're through it. But there was a journey along the way where you thought, I don't know if there's any hope in this. And yet you held on. Anyway, and you would say, but I've discovered hope. Anybody in that? I've discovered hope through the pain. I've discovered hope through the diagnosis. Would you just stand up for just a minute? And I'm standing up right now to say, been there, living there right now. So maybe someone else is in this room and you've recently faced a diagnosis yourself or for someone you love. And you're like, I'm not sure there's any hope. Look around this room. Circumstances don't have to dictate our hope. Amen, those of you standing? Okay. You can sit down. Thank you. So we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, and it's firm, meaning it's able to withstand storms. It's able to withstand difficult days. It's able to withstand the problems and the pain and the heartbreak that we will face in life. It's that kind of an anchor for your soul. Second word that Paul uses is secure. This anchor for the soul is secure. This, this word in the New Testament, it's a Greek word, it means to be immovable, to be steadfast. It means it doesn't waver. Every time that this word secure is used, it doesn't refer to humans. It's not this idea, you're immovable, or you're secure, or, or you're stable. It means you have this hope, you have this God, you have a faith that is secure even through your ups and downs, even when it feels like life is crashing around you, you can trust in this hope because it's secure, because it's not in you, it's in a faithful God. A few months ago, my wife and I started seeing a counselor. How many of you just judged me as soon as I said that? Some of you just judged me, which just proves, again, my fact that I believe with all of my heart, every single one of us should be in counseling, yes. especially those of you who just judged me. <laughs> We're in counseling because we've been through a hard, hard season of life. And we said, we probably jacked up in all kinds of ways, but, but we want to preemptively work through pain and grief. And we don't, we don't want to be reactive. We want to be proactive. And so a few weeks ago, we're sitting there, not lying on a couch, sitting there, all of your stereotypes. And, and, and our therapist does this. And he's like, I'm holding up a picture frame right now. 
and he, and he looked at me and he said, Aaron, uh, you're in my picture right now. Do you know what the title of my picture is? And I, handsome? <laughs> I've always wanted to be called that. Like if just one person would say that, it would make my day. He said, no, no, no. <clears throat> Traumatized. I was like, can I choose another word? I don't think I like that word. Traumatized. He said, do you know, like, the pain that you guys have been through? Do you know the struggles you've been through? You can't dismiss that. You can't ignore that and hope that it goes away. And you can't simply say, but, but I have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Everything's fine, right? No, you've got to got to work through it. And the truth is, there's some of us in this room, if we held up that picture before us today, it would say hopeless. It would say insecure, wavering. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, but you can have this hope as an anchor for your soul and you can withstand. You can be strong. You can be firm and you can be secure no matter what comes your way. Foundationally and fundamentally for our lives, this is the hope of salvation. Scripture talks about in many different ways. The hope of salvation. I'll give you a couple of examples. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul talks about this hope of salvation is like a helmet for our our heads to help us think, to help us see correctly. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. Listen, that we would know the hope of his calling, the hope that comes from. The next chapter, chapter 2, Paul says, but the problem is at one time you were in this world without hope and without God. And you need the hope of God to come and invade your life. I love this passage from 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes and says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a, say these two words with me, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a hope. We have a living hope that brings life to us. And this hope is found in Jesus. Amen? It's found in Jesus. It's not found in your circumstances. It's not found in your ability. It's not found in you trying to rationalize or figure it out. This hope is discovered in Jesus. And he meets us in the middle of our hurts. He meets us in the middle of our pain. He brings hope to those who are in despair. He, he brings hope. And doesn't just make bad people a little bit better. He brings life out of death. Resurrection power in our lives. Jesus gives a living hope so we can live a new kind of life. Hope's not in our circumstances. It's not in our possessions. It's not in our feelings. All of those things, all of those things are us trying to live. My anchor's in the wrong way. All of those things, our feelings, our circumstances, our possessions, are anchors that are just floating along, drifting. They're not grounded. But the living hope that we have in Jesus is a rock, solid, firm, and secure anchor for our soul. It's not a hope so kind of a thing, not a wish and a prayer kind of a thing. Even John the apostle wrote that in 1 John chapter 5, he says, I have written these things for you. I've, we've written these things who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might, so that you may, what's the word? No. It's an assurance. It's a certainty. It's secure. It's firm so that you may know that you have eternal life. Then he says, this is the confidence that we have. This is the hope that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us when we call out to him. God, I don't have any hope, but I need your hope. He listens. So I'm, whatever, 13, 14 years old. We're out on our Boston Whaler one day. 
and we're, we're in sort of the safe harbor of the intercoastal waterway, and all of a sudden over the radio, we get a, a, a message, or somebody's calling us, and, and they, they say, hey, are you out on your boat? And we're like, yes. They're like, you've got to come in the ocean, and we're like, why? And, and it's our friend Mike, and he said, the Spanish mackerel are running, which means they're like literally jumping out of the water, like decent sized fish. And he's like, as soon as you throw the spoon in the water, you're, you're reeling a fish in. It is amazing. You've got to come out here. And my dad's first response, is it rough out there? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's pretty rough, but the fishing is amazing. So in, in our boat is my, my dad and my mom. Neither one of them are the most adventurous people on the face of the earth. Uh, there's me who's like, go now. And then there's my sister who's a couple years younger than me. And so my dad's like, I don't know if we should do this or not. So let's, let's just go like to the edge of where you enter into the ocean and, and we'll see. Well, at that little spot, you have Hammocks Beach State Park that, that we love to go to. And then you have where one of the uh, outer banks comes up. And there's about a 50 yard span where the water just sort of builds up and it swells and it just rolls. They're not breakers, but they're just big swells. And so we pull our little 17 foot boat up and we just see all of the other boats doing like this as they go through. And we're like, that's pretty rough. And so my dad says, I don't think we should do this. Like I, it's our, one of our first days out on the boat. I'm not sure we should do this. Hey, Mike, we're not coming out. And Mike says, I'll be right there. <laughs> So all of a sudden you see this guy coming in and he is in this big boat and it's just like, he's crashing through every single wave. He comes right up next to our boat, pulls his boat up beside, and this is all he says, follow me. And then he guns it. And then my dad, I guess like in a macho kind of return, he's, hold on, and he guns it. And we start chasing and Mike is crashing through every wave. And here we are following right behind him. La, 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 la. And he's, and we're just following. Like, like Mike made a way where there didn't seem to be any way for us to get through this. He came and he got us and he said, you got to come out here. And, um, what, what's amazing is then we got through all of those waves and he's like, okay, now get ready. The fishing's amazing. And we're like, problem, we don't have a fishing rod. And he's like, oh, you people. So he gives us a fishing rod and I have one of the most amazing afternoons of my life catching Spanish mackerel as fast as I could get it out there. Every time I think about that story, I think about we would not have experienced any of that if Mike wouldn't have come and said, follow me and then led the way, made a way. And every time I think about that story, I think about, and we have no hope except for Jesus has come and he's made a way where there didn't seem to be a way. Jesus has come and he's went before us and he's went ahead of us and he has anchored deep into eternity the promises of God saying, I'm for you, I'm not against you. There's nothing that can hold you back from my hope if you find it in me. Jesus has come on a rescue mission to find us in the middle of, of our ick or our pain or our sin and he's come to deliver us. He's come to set us free and he's made a way. The Bible tells us on a cross he made a way. He took on himself on a cross the punishment that our sins deserve by his death on a cross. He's made it possible for us to be forgiven and free for our shame and our guilt and our sin to be dealt with, that he's come that we would have life for all eternity and on top of that, abundant life right now. And then he died for us, paying the ultimate price, dying so that we could live. And then on the third day, miraculously, God brought Jesus back to life. And we're told that same resurrection power, that same new beginning is available for every one of us. That's why Peter, the verse we read says, you can have, I can have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. And if we're honest today, some of us would have to say, I don't have that kind of hope. Like my life is carried about by whatever circumstance is going on. Good days, I'm good. Bad days, I'm bad. I just roll with it. But there's a hope that's an anchor for your soul that's firm and secure that enables us to live the life that 
only God can give us. How do we get this life? Scripture tells us, we, we've got a way that we talk about it around here. We call it I believe. This is an I believe card. And we, we talk about this life that we can find, this salvation or this hope that we can find in Jesus this way. When Jesus first started teaching, the Gospel of Mark records, some of his first words were this. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Well, what's the good news? The good news is more than just simply repent and believe. The good news is simply more than just that Jesus died, but it's that. It's more than just Jesus uh, was brought back to life from the grave. It's, it is that, but it's more than that. It's also the whole story that God from creation to eternity is a faithful God. That there is coming a day where every injustice, every wrong will be dealt with. There's coming a day, I don't know about you, but I can't wait, where there's no more dying. There's no more pain. Every tear is wiped away from our eyes. God will be fully ours before us and we'll be fully his people. That's the good news. It's all of that. And so Jesus says in light of the good news, <clears throat> which none of us can fully understand, repent and believe. Repentance is simply, uh, biblically, this idea of it's a change of mind. But, but probably represented by a change in life. It's literally like we're going that way. Maybe our hopes and dreams are in ourselves or in the future we're designing or planning or, or maybe self-centeredness. It's getting my way. I'm going that way. Repentance is a 180 about face. And it's turning away from those things. There's a change in our life. That's why we sing Jesus changes everything. Not because he makes life easier, he takes away all the pain, but because he changes us in the middle of the situation. So he does change everything. But repentance is a turning away from my way. It's a, it's a saying, God, I'm sorry I've sinned. It's like coming to terms that there's a separation between me and God, and it's my fault. God, I'm sorry and it's turning to receive hope and grace. We repent and we believe. Believing is just this idea of we are saying, Jesus, you are who you say you are. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul writes this, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. We repent in that we turn and we turn away from our ways and we turn to embrace God. We say, I'm sorry, but you are full of grace and love and hope. Your Lord, your Savior. And Jesus welcomes us in. We, this week I heard a story. And I just can't even understand it. I don't know all the details, but just the gist of it broke my heart. Where one of our students stood boldly this week in front of peers and said, I believe. And then they went and they talked to one of the counselor leaders and, and they were being prayed for. And they said, I've had walls. I don't know what words they used, but I've had walls built up since six years old. And tonight... Jesus changed everything. I'm just telling you, there's not supposed to be walls that a six-year-old has to build up in this world. But that's the world we live in, isn't it? But Jesus changes everything. And so maybe you're here and you would say, I, I need this hope. I, I long for Jesus to change me. There's no magical prayer that you can pray, but, but there's a prayer that has been written that I'm just going to pray it and it's going to be on the screen and you, if you want to. If God's moving in your heart, you can pray this too. And I'm telling you, if you mean this, with all sincerity, if you pray this, if you are to not today repenting and saying, I'm sorry, and you're believing, Jesus changes everything when we pray this. So I'm just going to invite you 
If God is stirring in your heart, don't put off. Don't, don't wait. Let today be the day that you declare, I believe. Here's a prayer. If this represents what's going on in your heart, will you just pray this there in your seat? Dear Jesus, you can pray this yourself there. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will. In your name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, here's, here's what we know. Scripture says that when one person repents, one person turns to God, that the angels in heaven, they do what? They rejoice. They have a celebration. It's just like, this is so amazing. We thank you, God. And here's what I want you to know, that, that we want to rejoice. We want to celebrate. But, but we also think there's something powerful. Scripture says that if we acknowledge Jesus before others, that, that God, that Jesus acknowledges us before the Father, there's something powerful when we declare our faith. So I'm going to ask you to join with our high schoolers, join with our uh, junior hires, join with dozens of other people who this weekend have done this. And whether you're in this room or the fireside room listening to my voice, if today, if today you're saying, I just prayed that prayer for the first time, I believe. I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you to do something courageous, but we want to celebrate with you. I'm going to ask you to stand and fill this room with this simple phrase. Stand and say, I believe. I believe. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Who's going to stand and say it? I believe. God bless you. God bless you. Would you stay standing for just a minute? Anybody else this morning? Boldly declare. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Hey, real quick, real quick. God bless you. Can you hold the applause just for a second so we can hear these bold declarations? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Awesome. Oh, oh, so good. God bless you. This is holy ground kind of stuff right now. If God is stirring your heart, respond. Can we just say, would you say standing, but can we just say, God, thank you so much. So everyone in this room who, who's standing, everyone in the fireside room who may be standing, here's what I want you to know. There's a team of some of our prayer partners over here and over here. Right now, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, and you could take a friend or somebody with you or go by yourself. Would you go there real quick right now as we pray? Go there. We have some resources. Next steps we would love to give you to, to take in your faith. There's a Bible, a free Bible we want to give you, but we just want, we have our prayer partners. would love to just be there for you. So everybody right now who's sitting, would you just close your eyes? We're going to pray. Those of you who are standing, would you go to one of those tables right now and let one of our prayer partners pray with you, give you some of this material for the next steps in your journey. But more than anything, we want to say thank you. But just for a moment, it's not weird. It's not going to get sketchy. Uh, but they would love to be able to pray with you right now. And as you stay seated, I'm going to invite you to pray. I'm going to invite those of you who are still in your seats to pray. And maybe your prayer today is, God, thank you for your hope. What would I do without your hope? Or maybe your prayer is, God, today, I need your hope so desperately. Maybe you didn't stand to say, I believe, but you feel like something is stirring inside of you. Don't hesitate right now. Go to one of our prayer partners and let them pray with you right now. God is working right now. But would you take about 45, 60 seconds, and in your own words, just lift up, a prayer to God. 
give us hope. Thank you for hope. We need you, God.